Where's the camera? Oh, there we are. Do I have to look at the camera? Yeah, you no, I'm looking at you. Yeah. You and okay. Well, you know, tell me something. How did you <clears throat> become an artist? <laughs> because I always was, I think. You know, I was born in England uh, during the war, and uh, there was a point where I became a Red Cross cadet. I mean, I always used to stand under the apple tree and sing for, for my family and stuff. But uh, we started raising money uh, for the uh, Red Cross, for the veterans in our village. And uh, there was this old car with a kind of stand on the back where you could put luggage in those days. And I said to the girls I was working with, hey, you know, that's a stage. Why don't we do a little show? And I'm all of, I think, nine, eight or nine, nine, I guess. And uh, that was really the beginning um, that I actually worked in front of an audience because people who came to, to uh, the white elephant sale that we had also arranged around the garden would just stand around and watch us and, you know. So that was kind of the beginning. And then, of course, I went to school. We did school plays and stuff and stuff. And... Uh, where did you go to school? In, in England. Which were about stuff in England? Pardon me? In where, which part of England? I was from Surrey, Surrey, but I went to school in London right. um, eventually because, you know, it was very difficult. There was a, a, a long time I was in Aldershot for a while, which was all the, all the um, troops and, you know, it, it wasn't a good time. However, then my mother uh, dragged me to Canada. I didn't want to come because I hadn't finished my schooling. But uh, she said, well, come for six months and if you don't like it, you can go back. And we arrived in London, Ontario. And uh, uh, right away, within a week actually, um, my mother met this lady who was uh, connected to London Little Theatre when Ken Basket was the director and president there. And she said, you know, I'm doing this play. And my mother immediately said, oh, I have a daughter who's an actress. And so before I knew it, I had a role in this first play. Uh, and I'd only been in Canada a little while. And it was called Rise and Shine. And I immediately thought, my God, had I stayed in England, uh, it, this never would have happened for years because it, it would have been very, you know, controlled as it is over there, as it was over there. And that was it. And from there on, I worked a lot with London Little Theatre. I got my first award, the Ontario Critics Award, from doing uh, Another Part of the Forest, mm -hmm. which was a gorgeous play. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Lots of comedy, of course, which I loved. And then uh, I got a chance to audition for Stratford uh, as an apprentice. But at that time, I was a bit fed up with living at home. My mum, we got along, but she, uh, and uh, no money. And I thought, oh God, another three years of no money and Stratford and that. And at that point, Air Canada came out with the opportunity to be a flight attendant, air uh, stewardess in those days without being a nurse. And I thought, I'm gonna go for this. So a girlfriend of mine who was a ballet dancer, we both went for the interviews and uh, unfortunately she was too short, but I got the job and loved it. And I originally only was going to stay a year, but they promoted me at the end of a year into their training school. They had built this gorgeous new training school. So I became a, a flight service instructor and um, I could fly with my students when it, when it, whenever during the summer uh, and wherever they were going. So that kind of kept me there for a while. But in the in the in, while I was there, I still did some theatre. Um, I uh, I did Laura, the play Laura, um, where I met Celeste Holm. She came as uh, one of our benefactors, and uh, then uh, I. Uh, started with a group of friends, Lakeshore Players. And we were the founders and, you know, just kept going as a, an amateur really at that point still, until one day, um, Jack Crisp and Jeanine Bobian from La Poudrière uh, kind of heard of me, I think, or whatever anyway, came and said, you know, would you be prepared to turn professional and come and work for us? Well, by then I was married and I had two little kids and I had to say, well, uh, so I did. And uh, it was fun. I was seven years the leading actress for Janine in the, in the English, on the English side because she was an in international theatre. And through that, 
uh, came my first film job. I was on stage um, and uh, Andre Champlain uh, here, the casting director, came and said, you know, we're looking for a wife for Ray Milan. You remember old Ray Milan? And I said, yeah, but I, you know, I, I'm just not trained as a film actress. I have no idea what to do. Oh, don't worry about it. It's, you know, we'll, we'll get you through it. So fine, I'm excited as anything, you know, I mean, so much more money in it, plus it's a film, it's a big star that I'm gonna work opposite, and da, 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 da. So I get on set the very first day, and all, you know, they say, no, all you have to do is walk in with your little tray, and he's gonna be across the room, and you're gonna say, good morning, darling, and you're gonna put the tray down, and daddy, daddy. So I walk in, morning, darling. And he's over there saying, you get your fucking head out of my camera. I almost died because my head had gone over, the camera's right behind me. I had no idea. I wanted to die. I thought, oh dear. But he became my mentor and he taught me everything I needed to know about film all during that film. It was fun. Yeah. So that that's was, the beginnings. Those are the beginnings. So that's to take us the chronologically, where are we now in time? So now we're, uh, we're in the early 70s, I think 72 or something like that. And you're living here? And I'm, I was living in Montreal, yes. Mm -hmm. And out in Beaconsfield, actually. And um, doing this theater stuff and, uh, well, the odd film job. And did you work at the C, at all, CBC? No, so that was the question that I thought, you know, I never did work for CBC, ever. Mm. Or, or if I did, I can't remember. Right. And I, I went through everything and I, I didn't really find anything. Did you ever do radio acting at all? I've done a lot of voice work. I mean, I, I had two famous um, voices that I used to do, Mrs. Hogganswaller, and I have to write the name down, what it, what, who was she, Mrs. Hogganswaller, and... Somebody else can't remember. So I used to do a lot of voice work, mm -hmm. but uh, and I guess that might might have been for radio. I can't remember really. Right. But um, because I have a British slight British now slight, but it's it was there, you know, British accent. It, it kind of restricted a bit, even though I can do other accents. In fact, my demo tape shows me doing four different kinds of accents. Which you asked me to do that today, I'd probably. It would be a stretch, really, but I can do the Cockney stuff, you know, and all the Irish and Scotch and Welsh and stuff, and the Southern American. Um, but um, I didn't do a lot of radio, no. Um, when, uh, when did you get your actor card? Yeah, that was a good question. It came automatically because I was full equity. Right. So it wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. And that's probably terrible to say, but it just happened automatically. No, I was, that's the rule. You know, yeah. so I... Probably I when you did the Ray Milan film, probably, is when you got it. Well, um, I was full equity before I went into his film, you yeah. see. So, yeah. So, I think that was it, you know. And um, uh, who knows? I just signed a paper and forgot about it. So, so for about 40 years you've been a member Oh, easily, yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, so talking about your early days, uh, you've already mentioned that Ray Milan was a mentor to you. Have you had any other insignificant mentors? Well, yes. I mean, I have to say that Le Poudrier, um, Robert Robinson, he's now in L.A., but he was a very, very good director here. And Robert was very good to me on the in the theater. Mm -hmm. He was really wonderful. And Janine... She's a dear friend still. Uh, she really believed in my talent, and I think she helped. Not that she could help me as an actress, but she could give me the jobs, you know, if you know what I mean. It, it, it suited her. So she was a very good mentor in that sense. Um, in film, everybody I worked with were good mentors. Yes. You know, I must say that I worked with a lot of big stars, uh, the, the odd one I didn't like, uh, Ellen Burstein, for example, she, uh, she and I worked together and I hated her. She was very mean. But later on when I did The Velveteen Rabbit and they decided that she would be the voice of the swan, I thought, oh my God, she's going to look at who's playing the grandmother and say, 
Mm. But she didn't. She said she thought the film was great and she was willing to do the voice. So everybody really that I worked with, I felt were, were good. They were not mentors, but they were encouraging. They, you know, um, but I suppose the, the, the one that stood out was Ray Milan because it was my first film ever and, and, and he was pretty damn nice after he was nasty. Uh, so it was good. Um, yeah, I've never had bad vibes about my career as an, as an artist, you know. Um, what do you think about Actor Fraternal Benefit Society? Ah, I think they're fabulous. Why? Uh, well, because look at where I am today. I'm in my 80th year. I'm going to be 80 in December. Looking so back. I'm in my 80th year. And, you know, I am now living on, not living on, but I get a lot of money back from all my uh, RSPs that were put in and it was encouraged to be done in those days. And plus, you know, they, they follow all my films. And let's face it, even if I'm only getting a dollar fifty from a film I did in like Benji that's still playing somewhere in Asia or who knows, you know, it's all great. And I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, uh, but I am an agent uh, with, with Actra's uh, blessing. But we keep it quiet because ethically it's not always the best thing to say you're an actor and an agent, even though I've got an agent of my own. But that's the first thing I talk to my kids about that come to join me straight out of theater school. Okay, the thing you have to aim for is to get a part of, become part of the union because the union is going to be your benefit at the end. Not now maybe, but later on when you're my age, you're gonna say, thank God. I put my money into AFBS or look at this, they're the only medical uh, group that allow me to have a, an implant. Nobody else does, you have to pay for it. Here, they are, you know. So these are the things that AFBS has been, and they've been great. And I love Jane Nelson, of course, you know. That's not the love. At my age, I forget things and I phone up, Jane, what, what does that mean? Does that, this mean, you know, and she's great. And, and of course Susan as well. I mean, they all are. And uh, one of the things they've asked me now, if uh, not they, but uh, it came up, that maybe we need a PAL residence in, in Montreal. So frankly, I have been working on it a bit. Um, I had a place lined up and the lady was very enthusiastic. I'm not sure it's gonna happen though, there. It's hard work, particularly in Quebec because of the French, you have to deal with the the government as well as, you know, whatever. And UDA is here and they have a place of their own. But I'll persevere. Um, I think it's good to have a place for old, tired out actors who haven't got much money and to be in with people that they can fight with or do shows with or whatever. So that's another little project that's out there somewhere. Um. <clears throat> So you, be, you, be, you became, you're multi-talented, you've been an actress, have you ever directed? No, and I've never wanted to. Okay, good. And I don't think I'm that good. And you've been, you've become an agent. And I became an agent, and yeah. it all happened because I went to live in Italy for 10 years. Wow. Where? In Rome. Mm -hmm. Well, in a place called Sacrofano, which is 19 kilometers north of Rome, but uh, the man I was living with at the time, it was after my divorce from my first husband, he was an artist and he had um, a studio in Rome on Via Maguta, um, which is between Piazza del Popolo and Piazza de Spagna. And um, so I used to, I mean, Rome was my city, so I couldn't act because I, I spoke Italian well, but with an accent. So what I used to do over there, I used to lip sync operettas for the Red Cross. And I got a group of the, um, well, the, the elite, let's say, you know, the princes and the barons and the baronesses and who were all old and not, with, not doing very much. And we did these little operettas. So that was one of the things I did. Um, I also met Fellini, who lived on the same street on Via Maguta. And eventually when I left, he gave me a beautiful handbag. I should have brought it with me. Um, that I carry with me still today whenever I'm on set and people say, oh my God, where did you get that beautiful bag? It's Fellini. falling apart. <laughs> well, it, Mr. Fellini gave it to me. Oh my God, oh my God, you know. But, um, and the other thing I did was, I did play one uh, 
um, one um, uh, 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 television thing, I was Garibaldi's mistress, the, the German woman, uh, for one season. And that was okay because of the accent. Uh, and then on the other thing I did was, so we did a um, cooking show between Rome and London. And the chef would cook and I would speak English and tell them what we were doing. And so I became a really great cook. It, it and how did this lead to you becoming an agent? Okay, so then I came back from uh, Italy having not done very much of anything and my agent here is a very good friend and he was busy as a bee in his agency and I say, oh Roger, oh right, I'll come and help. So I used to go over a couple of times a week and just help and, uh, and not being paid. And one day he said, you know what, why don't you just get a few clients of your own because you're not getting any money for me and you're here working yourself to death. So I thought, ah, why not? Give it a try. So I started and I stayed with him for a, a long time. And then um, I frankly couldn't stand this, the situation where we were, um, dogs and whatever, whatever. So one day I said, you know what? I think I'd like to just be on my own if it's okay with Actra. So I, I had long conversations with Actra about this and they said, well, you know, ethically, we, it's not, but we won't advertise you. It'll be word of mouth. You'll, it'll just be word of mouth for you. And of course, you'll keep your own agent and you should not have anybody of your own age on the roster, which is what I do. And that's how it's, it's gone. And so now I've been a very busy agent for seven years. So as an agent, you've, you've acted as a mentor to other people. Absolutely. And they love it. A lot of the reason why I get people asking me to represent them is because I'm an actor, mm -hmm. because I understand both sides. You know, like for, for example, today, this morning, I've got one woman who's got three commercial auditions, but she's living in Bromont and the weather. So, but she knows that I am very understanding mm -hmm that she must work to get some money, but on the other hand, she's not gonna put herself in danger to come in for these auditions and, you know, stuff like that. Plus, just all kinds of, they, they like me to look at their photographs and, you know, do you think this will sell or that and how do we and da di da di. Uh, yeah, I like it, I like it. Who's the uh, most interesting artist you've ever worked, worked with? with? Yes. I think Susan Sarandon. Why? She was so natural. She was, yeah, she was just so natural and so, so lovely. And just watching her, you know, it was like, it, it wasn't acting for her. It was just very interesting and, and normal. Um, everybody, everybody has their own little quirks. Bette Midler, for example, I worked with her. I couldn't stand her because all the time she kept worrying about, don't, don't photograph my knees, you know, and I used to think, we're not looking at your damn knees, we're watching your face, you know, we're listening to your voice, stuff like this, but, um, yeah, I, I have, uh, I, actually, I've had a pretty darn nice life all my life. I mean, I've had horrible things happen uh, on stage, for example, I mean, I was working with some of the big stars from Toronto, um, Ken Dyke was one of them, and we were doing First Night of Pygmalion, and I was the uh, narrator with uh, this young man called John Peters, and we had to tell the story and bring, did you know John? Yeah, I worked with John. He's yeah. another, yeah. I wish I knew where he was today. He knows naughty verses to every great song ever written. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. I mean, he used to be so funny. And uh, so we, we would have to bring on the actors, you see, and we'd be narrating and our, our cue would bring them in. So I'm narrating away and doing my thing and I look out and, I, and here's Ken Dyed out there in the wing saying, and I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I've turned two pages. And he's left standing out there. You know, that kind of thing happens, mm -hmm. but. What is, what is the most, um, I guess, the, your favorite moment in your career? Do you have one? Oh God. I don't really have any. I mean, I loved them all. I mean, I can think of some of the funniest uh, were, were, were in the last play I did. Uh, do you know Neil Napier? Neil Napier? Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, well, he, he was playing with me and 
you know, I'm old now, and so I need to wear orthotics in shoes, and so, you know, to wear dance shoes, which I had to do in that play, it was very difficult, uh, because I had to get them on, and we had like 25 seconds between this scene and that scene, you know, and, and so <laughs> one time I came on carrying the shoes, because I couldn't get them on in time. So he's lovely at ab-living, he said, oh, so Lily, so you couldn't get your shoes on, huh? All right, sit down, I'll help. So I put them down, and of course I had them reversed. So then he said, Lily, have you always worn your left shoe on your right foot? I mean, the audience is killing themselves laughter, laughing, thinking it's normal, you know. <laughs> so that was great. But um, the other, the other um, interesting play I did was, of course, Sisters Rosenzweig, and that was with Felicia Schulman as my sister. And... Uh, um, McLeod, uh, the love boat, um, what's his first name? Gavin. Gavin, as my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And I remember the director saying to me, well, Gavin McLeod has asked if he thinks that the guy, the lady, Sarah, is going to be as beautiful as she should be for him. And I said, and what did you say? He said, I showed him your photograph. And he said, yeah, okay, she, she, she'll do. <laughs> <laughs> But he was very nice to work with. He was. Um, so, uh, if you so were, highlights, I've had highlights all the way down the line. If you were to give any advice to a younger actor, what would it be? If you're really serious and passionate about being an actor, then it really has to be your first priority. In other words, you cannot say, "Oh, you know." I, I, I need to get a job to work, to live. Yes, we all understand that, but you have to make it clear to the people you're going to do your waiting for or whatever it is you're going to do, that you are first and foremost an actor and you have to have the freedom to go and at least try rehearse uh, auditions and things like that. I, but, but the first and foremost thing is stay with your passion and and, and accept it as a passion and a, and a talent and don't think that this is going to bring you a fortune because it probably isn't mm. but it's going to give you a lot of pleasure through your life it really is now speaking of fortune and what financial advice would you give a young actor starting out get your money into RSPs with the FBS <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> No, that, I mean, you have to do that, you know. Uh, I have, um, I did that, but mind you, I was married at the, at the very beginning of my career, um, but I've always been very frugal and, man, and thought about my old age because, let's face it, that's probably going to be the toughest part for anybody. Um, so it's that, just try to... Put aside a little bit if you can. If it's impossible for a while, then okay, but try and keep it going. Buy your RSPs, get it into, because that's the other thing about AFBS. I have a, a, a financial advisor outside as well, and I show her my a, AFBS, um, you know, uh, RSP statements, and she's amazed. They do so well. They really do so well in their investments, who they choose, how they do it. And I, I just tell the kids, this is, this is it. And, you know, don't get carried away with the idea that you've got to be the, the best dressed, the, the, the latest fashion. Sort. No, you don't have to. Always keep a couple of steady pieces in your, in your wardrobe that can be used for business like uh, auditions or dance things or whatever. Just keep them there, keep them cleaned, keep them nice, and use them over and over again because. That way you don't have to go out and, like one kid of mine, he was fabulous, but I could have died. He had to go in and do a soldier audition or something, can't remember now. And um, he said, well, what do I wear? I said, look, you, you've got some, probably some khaki or something. I said, that'll do. He went out and bought himself a real, uh, oh, second hand, mind you, jacket, uh, khaki or something. I said, oh, and he didn't get the role. And I said, you know, come on, Adam, you don't have to do that, dear. You just don't have to. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really about watching your money, preparing for the future, and working, of course, but 
with the understanding that you are first and foremost an actor. Is there such a thing as retirement? Not for me. I just say I'm changing my job. <laughs> I don't believe in the word retirement. You know, I teach seniors, really seniors. Uh, they're in their 80, 80s and 90s. One of them, one lady is 96. But, you know, we talk about it. There's no such word as retirement. The minute you say the word retirement, it, you're already dying. You know, you might as well say, well, let's see, I've had enough of that. I think I'll do something else. You know, I garden. I'm a very good gardener because I came from England. We had to grow all our vegetables. And even at school as kids, we had, what did we call them in those Did days? You there you go. Thank you. And, uh, and then from there, you know, I lived in a house with my own garden all my life. And then I go to Italy. Oh my God. <laughs> I had a great gardener and he taught me another way of gardening that had to do with the sun and the moon and the stars and this and that, you know, that I never really thought about. But, um, so then, if you don't mind my going on to something else, I have a son who's a professor of biology in Minneapolis. And he, hopefully from my influence, decided that he'd like to start a garden in, around the university that they could grow vegetables and then pass them down to the poorer parts of Minneapolis. Um, so that now he's so excited about all this stuff that he's planning to take a group of students to Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, he's not sure yet, to do like victory gardens over there as well. So, you know, maybe when I'm finished here, or I don't know, I don't think I'll be an agent until I'm 100, um, maybe I'll just join him over in Bangladesh and garden. I, I don't know. Mm. It's a great spir um, uh, spiritual kind of center to your life. Then. Yeah, I don't believe in God. I'm an absolute atheist and I lost it when I was lying under those shelters during the war and listening to those bu buzz bombs droning overhead and knowing that any mm -hmm. now, moment now it could be us. And I remember I used to love to sing in the choir and go to every church. We had a Baptist across and an Anglican and a, a Catholic. And I'd go to all of them as a little girl just to sing. But when that all happened, I can remember definitely thinking in my head, there's nobody out there looking down at us, come on. So my philosophy in life is, you don't know where you're gonna be born or to whom, but wherever it is, you're gonna do the best you can with what you've got and leave the world hopefully a tiny bit better than when you came in. And obviously the world is having a lot of problems today. And if I could do anything, I mean, I'm, I must admit, I'm rather militant about the planet because it comes from my son uh, a little bit. But I, I get so angry when I see somebody sitting in their car running their engine and using their cell phone. I will literally knock on the window and say, excuse me, do you mind turning off your engine? The planet would love you. You know, we know that it's, it, it's in bad shape. And as my son said, don't you worry, mum. It's probably got another 50 years. <laughs> um. Uh, you cook. Oh, do I ever? Talk yes. About your cooking. Well, I'll tell you my last disaster, and it was last week. Um, my agent said, I want to come for dinner. And I said, Oh, God, all right. You're British, I'm British, so let's see. I haven't done a toad in the hall for ages. Right. So I'd forgotten the finesse of a toad in the hall, and I made it, and it, it worked, but it, it was horrible. It, it just didn't rise up in the middle. So then I went and looked at all the recipes and realized that it was all about heating the pan first, getting it as hot as you can, getting the oil in there to sizzle, and then you put your batter a little bit, and then your sausages, and then your batter. I hadn't done that. I put everything in, and of course it didn't work. But my favorite cooking, obviously, is Italian. I mean, I grow my own basil, so I make my own pesto. I make my own tomato sauce. I well, I make anything Italian and love it. Want to come for dinner? If I were in town another night, I would take you up on that. <laughs> I cook too. I love cooking. I love do you? Cooking. Oh, do you? Yeah. And I worked in Italy, in Florence. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Oh, so wow. I, uh, 
I just what as a cook, as a chef? No, no, as a director. Oh, as a director. I, I directed in a, 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 a world premiere at a festival of an avant-garde theater out there in Italian with Italian actors. Oh wow, yeah. wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, you see, I lived, I stayed in Florence or near Florence quite a bit because I had a friend who had a home there. And, and also in um, Toscana. Oh, that's the other thing I did over there. Of course, I'm forgetting. I used to sell wine. Really? Yeah, because um, Gaetano, who is an artist, he was the man I was living with, my the great love of my life, I have to say, even though he was the worst womanizer in the world, and that's why I eventually left him. I just couldn't stand it anymore. But he, his bro uh, brother-in-law had a um, hacienda in Piacenza, which is near Milan, between Milan and Florence. And so um, he came to me one day and he said, Yuna, tu sei un, un, una donna superb, con un accento straniera, veramente bella. Why don't you sell my wine? And I thought, why not? Mm. So we used the studio in Biamaguta for digustazioni, mm -hmm. and I began to sell wine. Now, the only problem with it was they're so damned corrupt, these people. They always expected me to give them a case of wine when they delivered. Uh, Laura, Senora, you know, but but I did very well, and I did try when I came back here. I did try to bring it with me, uh, have them, you know. But our Frizzanti, the the little uh, sparkling white one, was so good, but it, it just would not travel. So that didn't happen. And at the time I came back, which was '87, the Italian wines were not really well thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, they just want it. Ca it came about a couple of years later, but mm -hmm. at that time. So anyway, I did bring over some of the red and tried to get it going, but it, it really didn't work. But that was fine, because then I'd, I'd gone on to, or come back to being an actor, I hoped, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, that, that was the other thing I did. You're right, I forgot. And of course, I did a lot of entertaining in, in Italy, because he was an artist, and he needed to talk about his work. So we went everywhere, um, and, and I remember, and he was an ex carabinieri and that was the other funny thing. I'm British, he's Italian, he was my enemy at one point, so all these carabinieri would come for dinner, and they'd be talking about, you know, uh, and I'd say, oh, tensioni, sono inglesi, ricordati, oh, oh, you know, so we had to be careful. But, you know, we used to have the capo de stato maggiore there, he was the big general, and he always traveled with his wife and his mistress. So, you know, my guy used to think, well, yeah, yeah that's fine. And, uh, and I used to say, no, I'm different. I'm a northern head. I don't accept that kind of behavior from you. He can do it. We can forget about him, but not you. <laughs> didn't work. Didn't take. <laughs> no, it didn't. And especially it all ended uh, in 87, in the summer of 87, when my son, who was now a young man in university, and he came to stay with us in Sardinia, Janine Bobian was there, there were a few friends, but Adam watched my guy on the beach, and he, you know, he, a lot of stuff he did just to make himself look good, even though he's, he was having these nasty little affairs secretly in, in, in his studio, but all this other stuff, um, he would really make a fool of himself, actually. And Adam, my son, said, Mom, if you're going to stay here with this guy, you're going to lose my respect. And I have to say, it was at the time when also AIDS, if you remember, came out, 85. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Gaetano was bringing in young American girls to his studio to look at his etchings kind of stuff. And I thought, oops, can't go on with that anymore. Yeah. So it kind of ended there. Right. Um, it's an uh, actress. 70th birthday mm. this year. Mm. So could you finish by saying happy birthday, actress? Absolutely, actor. Happy birthday. <laughs> and I, for my 80th birthday, guess what I'm going to do? What? I'm going to throw a Downton Abbey party. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. I don't know where yet, but I'm determined that everybody's going to come dressed in tux and beautiful gowns and Get all your clients to play the downstairs staff and do English accents <laughs> as an actor. Now exercise. that's a good idea. I never <laughs> thought of that. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah all but your, your handsome young boys be, you know, come in with food. Well, well, that you know, the footman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no that could be fun. I, I, I hadn't thought about them because I didn't want to get them involved in having to accept the fact their agent was eighty. Because you know, sometimes they. 
would they accept that? That this old fart is still. You should do what the French women do. Is you should say I'm ninety. Oh and no! They, but they, they, my friends say to me, Yuna, you're not eighty yet. You've only just turned seventy-nine. Because when I was seventy-seven, I'd say I'm in my seventy-eighth year, and I then. Did, I did say that. Yeah. Huh? yeah. I, I said, yeah, but you're born on this day, and you have to do a year before. It. So I, you know, anyway, yeah. So, yeah, I'll say I'm ninety. That that that'll be really you're good. Fantastic. <laughs> It's been a good life. I have to say, though, you know, I'm beginning to do stupid things. Like yesterday, this morning, I got an email before I came. I checked, and this little girl said, "Yuna, it looks like I have an interview at Actra this morning." And I'm thinking, "Oh my God!" And sure enough, I go back into sent things, and I had attached it to her an email I sent her. But I realized I'd also sent her a second email saying, "Sorry, Chantel, I've attached the wrong thing, so don't." So ignore it. But she hadn't seen that or hadn't bothered. Because I'm thinking, oh, don't tell me that I've done something awful again, you know, being in my old age. But, what? Anyway. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Isn't it fun that we just met and now here we are? Yes, it is indeed. Where are you living, actually? Toronto. Oh, you're in Toronto. Yeah. I love Toronto. I was just down working in the next month, so... It was convenient for me to come do these here. Yeah, I think it's lovely, and thank you very much. Was I outrageous? No, you were great. Gorgeous. Absolutely. Okay. Not well, enough stuff about Actra, though, maybe? I don't no, know. No, it was Because there were all yeah. kinds of questions. I know that you asked some, some of the funny things, and I'd written down yeah. stuff, but yeah. one of the funniest things that ever happened. Did you, did you, did you know Nonny? Griffin? Griffin, yeah. Yes, well. Um, because we were on stage once and, and the, it was a very serious scene and the audience is killing themselves laughing and we're looking at each other. And we look down and there's this mother cat carrying a kitten across the stage. Oh my God. I adopted that kitten <laughs> and I called her Sarah for Sarah Bernhardt. Oh, yeah. cool. I okay. played Hamlet uh, on the same stage that Sarah Bernhardt played Hamlet. Ah. Monument National. Oh. Mm -hmm. So there you go. These are the memories, aren't they? Yes. Indeed. And I, I think you feel them. I think you can feel the, the, the power of what's gone ahead of you. And yeah, I, like you know, uh, my teacher at theater school, Joy Cockhill, she... Um, oh, I know Joy. We gave her the Leslie Yeo Award to come, uh, the first year it came out, and she gave a wonderful speech where she said, you know, I've always felt that I'm walking in a long line of people in my hand, is holding the person's hand in front of me and I'm reaching out to the person behind me. And that's what we do as artists. And I think it's such a great definition. Oh, I like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's probably yeah. absolutely true. We're just a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Very nice talking yeah, to you. Yeah, and you. And